Chapter 6 Why I'm Not Where You Are 521 63 Your mother and I never talk about the past. That's a rule. I go to the door when she's using the bathroom and she never looks over my shoulder when I'm writing. Those are two more rules. I open doors for her, but I never touch her back. She passes through. She never lets me watch her cook. She folds my pants but leaves my shirts by the ironing board. I never light candles when she's in the room, but I do blow candles out. It's a rule that we never listen to sad music. We made that rule early on. Songs are as sad as the listener. We hardly ever listen to music. I change the sheets every morning to wash away my writing. We never sleep in the same bed twice. We never watch television shows about sick children. She never asked me how my day was. We always eat on the same side of the table, facing the window. So many rules. Sometimes I can't remember what's a rule and what isn't. If anything we do is for its own sake, I'm leaving her today. Is that the rule we've been organizing ourselves around this whole time, or am I about to break the organizing rule? I used to ride the bus here at the end of every week to take the magazines, newspapers that people left behind when they got on their planes. Your mother reads and reads and reads. She wants English as much as she can get her hands on. Is that a rule? I'd come late Friday afternoon. It used to be that I would go home with a magazine or two or maybe a paper, but she wanted more, more slang, more figures of speech, the bee's knees, the cat's pajamas, horse of a different color, dog tired. She wanted to talk like she was born here, like she never came from anywhere else. So I started bringing a knapsack, which I would stuff with as much as would fit. It got heavy. My shoulders burned with English. She wanted more English. So I brought a suitcase. I filled it until I could barely zip the zipper. The suitcase sagged with English. My arms burned with English. My hands did. My knuckles. People must have thought I was actually going somewhere. The next morning, my back ached with English. I found myself sticking around, spending more time than was necessary, watching the planes bring people and take people away. I started coming twice a week and staying for several hours. When it was time to go home, I didn't want to leave. And when I wasn't here, I wanted to be here. Now I come every morning before we open the store and every evening after dinner. So what is it? Am I hoping to see someone I know get off one of the planes? Am I waiting for a relative who will never come? Do I expect Anna? No, that's not it. It's not about my joy, the relief of my burden. I like to see people reunited. Maybe it's a silly thing, but what can I say? I like to see people run into each other. I like the kissing. I like the crying. I like the impatience, the stories that the mouth can't tell fast enough, the ears that aren't big enough, the eyes that can't take in all of the change. I like the hugging, the bringing together, the end of missing someone. I sit on the side with a coffee and I write in my day book. I examine the flight schedules that I've already memorized. I observe, I write. I try not to remember the life that I didn't want to lose but lost and have to remember. Being here fills my heart with so much joy, even if the joy isn't mine. And at the end of the day, I fill the suitcase with old news. Maybe that was the story I was telling myself when I met your mother. I thought we could run to each other. I thought we could have a beautiful reunion, although we hardly knew each other in Dresden. It didn't work. We've wandered in place, our arms outstretched, but not towards each other. They're marking off distance. Everything between us has been a rule to govern our life together. Everything a measurement, a marriage of millimeters, of rules. When she gets up to go to the shower, I feed the animals. That's a rule. So she doesn't have to be self-conscious. She finds things to keep herself busy when I undress at night. Rule. She goes to the door to make sure it's locked. She double-checks the oven. She tends to her collections in the china cabinet. She checks again in curlers that she hasn't used twice since we met. And when she gets undressed, I've never been so busy in my life. Only a few months into our marriage, we started marking off areas in the apartment as nothing places, in which one could be assured of complete privacy. We agreed that one would never look at the marked-off zones, that they would be non-existent territories in the apartment in which one could temporarily cease to exist. The first was in the bedroom, by the foot of the bed. We marked it off with red tape on the carpet, and it was just large enough to stand in it. It was a good place to disappear. We knew it was there, but we never looked at it. It worked so well that we decided to create a nothing place in the living room. It seemed necessary because there are times when one needs to disappear while in the living room, and sometimes one simply needs to disappear. We made this zone slightly larger so that one of us could lie down in it. It was a rule that you never would look at that rectangle of space. It didn't exist. And when you were in it, neither did you. For a while, that was enough. But only for a while. We required more rules. On our second anniversary, we marked off an entire guest room as a nothing place. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Sometimes a small patch at the foot of the bed or a rectangle in the living room isn't enough privacy. 
side of the door that faced the guest room was nothing. The side that faced the hallway was something. The knob that connected them was neither something nor nothing. The walls of the hallway were nothing. Even pictures need to disappear, especially pictures. But the hallway itself was something. The bathtub was nothing. The bath water was something. The hair on our bodies was nothing, of course. But once it collected around the drain, it was something. We were trying to make our lives easier, trying with all of our rules to make life effortless. But a friction began to arise between nothing and something. The nothing vase cast a something shadow, like the memory of someone you've lost. What can you say about that? That night the nothing light from the guest room spilled under the nothing door and stained the something hallway. There's nothing to say. It became difficult to navigate from something to something without accidentally walking through nothing. And when something, a pen, a pocket watch, was accidentally left in a nothing space, it never could be retrieved. That was an unspoken rule. All of our rules had been. At a point a year or two ago, when our apartment was more nothing than something, that in itself didn't have to be a problem. It could have been a good thing. It could have saved us. We got worse. I was sitting on the sofa in the second bedroom one afternoon, thinking and thinking and thinking, when I realized I was on a something island. How did I get here? I wondered, surrounded by nothing. And how can I get back? The longer your mother and I lived together, the more we took each other's assumptions for granted. The less was said, the more misunderstood. I'd often remember having designated a space as nothing when she was sure that we had agreed it was something. Our unspoken agreements had led to disagreements, to suffering. I started to undress right in front of her. This was just a few months ago, and she said, Thomas, what are you doing? And I gestured. I thought this was nothing, covering myself with one of my day books, and she said, It's something. We took the blueprint of our apartment from the hallway closet and taped it to the inside of the front door. With an orange and green marker, we separated something from nothing. This is something, we decided. This is nothing. Something, something, nothing, something, nothing. Nothing, nothing. Everything was forever fixed. There would be only peace and happiness. It wasn't until last night, our last night together, that the inevitable question finally arose. I told her, something, by covering her face with my hands and then lifting them like a marriage veil. We must be. But I knew in the most protected part of my heart the truth. Excuse me, do you know what time it is? The beautiful girl didn't know the time. She was in a hurry. She said, good luck. I smiled. She hurried off, her skirt catching the air as she ran. Sometimes I can hear my bones straining under the weight of all the lives I'm not living. In this life, I'm sitting in an airport trying to explain myself to my unborn son. I'm filling the pages of this, my last day book. I'm thinking of a loaf of black bread that I left out one night. The next morning, I saw the outline of the mouse that had eaten through it. I cut the loaf into slices and saw the mouse at each moment. I'm thinking of Anna. I would give everything never to think about her again. I can only hold on to the things I want to lose. I'm thinking of the day we met. I need her father to meet my father. They were friends. They had talked about art and literature before the war, but once the war began, they talked only about war. I saw her approaching when she was still far away. I was 15. She was 17. We sat together on the grass while her father spoke inside. Could we have been younger? We talked about nothing in particular, but it felt like we were talking about the most important things. Fistfuls of grass, and I asked her if she liked to read. She said, no, but there are books that I love, love, love. Like that, three times. Do you like to dance? She asked. Do you like to swim? I asked, and we looked at each other until it felt like everything would just burst into flames. Do you like animals? Do you like bad weather? Do you like your friends? I told her about my sculpture. She said, I'm sure you'll be a great artist. How can you be sure? I just am. I told her I already was a great artist because that's how unsure of myself I was. She said, I meant famous. I told her that wasn't what mattered to me, so she asked what mattered to me. I told her that I did it for its own sake. She laughed and said, you don't understand yourself. I said, of course I do. She said, of course. I said, I do. She said, there's nothing wrong with not understanding yourself. She saw through the shell of me into the center of me. Do you like music? Our fathers came out of the house and stood at the door. One of them asked, what are we going to do? I knew that our time was almost over. I asked her if she liked sports and she asked me if I liked chess. I asked her if she liked fallen trees. She went home with her father. The center of me followed her, but I was left with the shell of me. I needed to see her again. I couldn't explain my need to myself, and that's why it was such a beautiful need. There's nothing wrong with not understanding yourself. 
The next day, I walked half an hour to her house, fearing somebody would see me on the road between our neighborhoods. Too much to explain that I couldn't explain. I wore a broad-brimmed hat and kept my head down. I heard the footsteps of those passing me, and I didn't know if they were a man's, woman's, or child's. I felt as if I were walking the rungs of a ladder laid flat. I was too ashamed or embarrassed to make myself known to her. How would I have explained it? Was I walking up the ladder or down? I hid behind a mound of earth that had been dug up to make a grave for some old books. Literature was the only religion her father practiced. When a book fell on the floor, he kissed it. When he was done with a book, he tried to give it away to somebody who would love it. And if he couldn't find a worthy recipient, he buried it. I looked for her all day, but didn't see her. Not in the yard, not through a window. I promised myself I would stay until I found her, but as night began to come in, I knew I had to go home. I hated myself for going. Why couldn't I be the kind of person who stays? I walked back with my head down. I couldn't stop thinking about her, even though I hardly knew her. I didn't know what good would come of going to go see her, but I knew that I needed to be near her. It occurred to me, as I walked back to her the next day with my head down, that she might not be thinking of me. The books had been buried, so I hid this time behind a group of trees. I imagined their roots wrapped around books, pulling nourishment from the pages. I imagined rings of letters in their trunks. I waited for hours. I saw your mother in one of the second floor windows. She was just a girl. She looked back at me, but I didn't see Anna. A leaf fell. It was yellow like paper. I had to go home, and then the next day I had to go back to her. I skipped my classes. The walk happened so quickly, my neck strained from hiding my face. My arm brushed the arm of someone passing, a strong, solid arm, and I tried to imagine whom it belonged to, a farmer, a stone worker, a carpenter, a bricklayer. When I got to her house, I hid beneath one of the back windows. A train rattled in the past in the distance. People coming, people leaving, soldiers, children. The window shook like an eardrum. I waited all day. Did she go on some sort of trip? Was she on an errand? Was she hiding from me? When I came home, my father told me that her father had paid another visit. I asked him why he was out of breath. He said, Things keep getting worse. I realized that her father and I must have passed each other on the road that morning. What things? Was his the strong arm I felt brushing past me? Everything! The world! Did he see me, or did my hat and lowered head protect me? Since when? Perhaps his head was down too. Since the beginning... The harder I tried not to think about her, the more I thought about her, the more impossible it became to explain. I went back to her house. I walked the road between our two neighborhoods with my head down. She wasn't there again. I wanted to call her name, but I didn't want her to hear my voice. All of my desire was based on that one brief exchange. Held in the palm of her half hour together were 100 million arguments and impossible admissions and silences. I had so much to ask her. Do you like to lie on your stomach and look for things under the ice? Do you like plays? Do you like it when you can hear something before you can see it? I went again the next day. The walk was exhausting. With each step, I further convinced myself that she had thought badly of me, or worse, that she hadn't thought of me at all. I walked with my head bowed, my broad-brimmed cap pushed low. When you hide your face from the world, you can't see the world. And that's why, in the middle of my youth, in the middle of Europe, in between our two villages, on the verge of losing everything, I bumped into something and was knocked onto the ground. It took me several breaths to gather myself together. At first, I thought I'd walked into a tree, but then that tree became a person who was also recovering on the ground, and then I saw that it was her, and she saw that it was me. Hello, I said, brushing myself off. Hello, she said. This is so funny. Yes. How could it be explained? Where were you going? I asked. Just for a walk, she said. And you? Just for a walk. We helped each other up. She brushed leaves from my hair. I wanted to touch her hair. That's not true, I said, not knowing what the next words out of my mouth would be, but wanting them to be mine, wanting them more than I'd ever wanted anything, to express the center of me and be understood. I was walking to see you, I told her. I've come to your house each of the last six days. For some reason, I needed to see you again. She was silent. I had made a fool of myself. There's nothing wrong with not understanding yourself. And she started laughing, laughing harder than I'd ever felt anyone laugh. The laughter brought on tears. The tears brought on more tears. And I started laughing out of the most deep and complete shame. I was walking to you, I said again, as if to push my nose into my own shit, because I wanted to see you again. She laughed and laughed. <laughs> that explains it, she said again when she was able to speak. It? 
That explains why, each of the last six days, you weren't at your house. We stopped laughing. I took the world into me, rearranged it, and sent it back out as a question. Do you like me? Do you know what time it is? He told me it's 9.38. He looks so much like me, I could tell that he saw it too. We shared the smile of recognizing ourselves in each other. How many imposters do I have? Do we all make the same mistakes, or has one of us gotten it right, or even just a bit less wrong? Am I the imposter? I just told myself the time, and I'm thinking of your mother, how young and old she is, how she carries around her money in an envelope, how she makes me wear suntan lotion no matter what the weather, how she sneezes and says, God bless me. God bless her. She's at home now, writing her life story. She's typing while I'm leaving, unaware of the chapters to come. It was my suggestion. And at the time, I thought it was a very good one. I thought maybe if she could express herself rather than suffer herself, if she had a way to relieve the burden, she lived for nothing more than living, with nothing to get inspired by, to care for, to call her own. She helped out at the store, then came home and sat in her big chair and stared at her magazines. Not at them, but through them. She let the dust accumulate on her shoulders. I pulled my old typewriter from the closet and set her up in the guest room with everything she'd need. A card table for a desk, a chair, paper, some glasses, a pitcher of water, hot plates, some flowers, crackers. It wasn't a proper office, but it would do. She said, but it's a nothing place, I wrote. What better a place to write your life story? She said, my eyes are crummy. I told her they were good enough. She said, they barely work, putting her fingers over them. But I knew that she is just embarrassed by the attention. She said, I don't know how to write. I told her there's nothing to know. Just let it come out. She put her hands on the typewriter like a blind person, feeling somebody's face for the first time, and said, I've never used one of these before. I told her, just press the keys. She said she would try, and though I'd known how to use a typewriter since I was a boy, trying was more than I could ever do. For months it was the same. She would wake up at 4 a.m., go to the guest room. The animals would follow her. I would come home. I wouldn't see her again until breakfast, and then after work we'd go our separate ways and not see each other until it was time to fall asleep. I was worried about her, putting all of her life into her life story. No, I was happy for her. I remembered the feeling she was feeling. The exhilaration of building the world anew. I heard from behind the door the sounds of creation, the letters pressing into the paper, the pages being pulled from the machine, everything being for once better than it was and as good as it could be, everything full of meaning. And then one morning, this spring, after years of working in solitude, she said, I'd like to show you something. I followed her to the guest room. She pointed in the direction of the card table in the corner, on which the typewriter was wedged between two stacks of paper, of about the same height. We walked over together. She touched everything on the table and handed me the stack on the left. She said, My life. Excuse me? I asked by shrugging my shoulders. She tapped the page. My life! She said again. I rifled the pages. There must have been a thousand of them. I put the stack down. What is this? I asked by putting her palms on the tops of my hands and then turning my palms upward, flipping her hands off mine. My life, she said so proudly. I just made it up to the present moment, just now. I'm all caught up with myself. The last thing I wrote was, I'm going to show him what I've written. I hope he loves it. I picked up the pages and wandered through them, trying to find the one on which she was born, her first love, when she saw her parents... And I was looking for Anna, too. I searched and searched. I got a paper cut on my forefinger and bled a little flower on the page on which I should have seen her kissing somebody. But this was all I saw. I wanted to cry, but I didn't cry. I probably should have cried. I should have drowned us there in the room, ended our suffering. They would have found us falling face down in 2,000 white blank pages or buried under the salt of my evaporated tears. I remembered just then, and far too late, that years before I had pulled the ribbon from the machine. It had been an act of revenge against the typewriter and against myself. I pulled it into one long thread, unwinding the negative it held. The future homes I had created for Anna, the letters I wrote without response, as if it would protect me from my actual life. But worse, it's unspeakable. Write it! I realized that your mother couldn't see the emptiness. She couldn't see anything. I knew that she'd had difficulty. I'd felt her grasp my arm when we walked. I heard her say, my eyes are crummy, but I thought it was a way to touch me. Another figure of speech. Why didn't she ask for help? Why instead did she just ask for all those magazines and papers if she couldn't see them? Was that how she asked for help? 
Was that why she held so tightly to railings? Why she couldn't cook without me watching or change her clothes with me watching or open doors? Did she always have something to read in front of her so she wouldn't have to look at anything else? All the words I'd written to her, all of those years, had I never said anything to her at all? Wonderful, I told her, by rubbing her shoulder in a certain way that we have between us. It's wonderful. Go ahead, she said. Tell me what you think. I put her hand on the side of my face. I tilted my head towards my shoulder in the context in which she thought our conversation was taking place that meant, I can't read it here like this. I'll take you to the bedroom. I'll read it slowly, carefully. I'll give your life story what it deserves. But in what I knew to be the context of our conversation, it meant, I have failed you. Do you know what time it is? The first time Anna and I made love was behind her father's shed. The previous owner had been a farmer, but Dresden started to overtake the surrounding villages, and the farm was divided into nine plots of land. Anna's family owned the largest. The walls of the shed collapsed one autumn afternoon. A leaf too many, her father joked. And the next day he made new walls of shelves, so that the books themselves would separate inside from outside. The new overhanging roof protected the books from rain, but during the winter the pages would freeze together. Come spring, they would let out a sigh. He made a little salon out of the space, carpets, two small couches. He loved to go out there in the evenings with a glass of whiskey and a pipe and take down books and look through the wall at the center of the city. He was an intellectual. Although he wasn't important, maybe he would have been important if he had lived longer. Maybe great books were coiled within him like springs, books that could have separated inside from outside. The day Anna and I made love for the first time, he met me in the yard. He was standing with a disheveled man whose curly hair sprang up in every direction, whose glasses were bent, whose white shirt was stained with the fingerprints of his print-stained hands. Thomas, please meet my friend, Simon Goldberg. I said hello. I didn't know who he was or why I was being introduced to him. I wanted to find Anna. Mr. Goldberg asked me what I did. His voice was handsome and broken, like a cobblestone street. I told him, I don't do anything. He laughed. Don't be so modest, Anna's father said. I want to be a sculptor. Mr. Goldberg took off his glasses and tucked his shirt from his pants and cleaned his lenses with his shirt tail. You want to be a sculptor? I said, I'm trying to be a sculptor. He put his glasses back on his face, pulling the wire earpieces behind his ears and said, In your case, trying is being. What do you do? I asked in a voice more challenging than I'd wanted. He said, well, I don't do anything anymore. Anna's father told him, don't be so modest, although he didn't laugh this time, and he told me, Simon is one of the great minds of our age. I'm trying, Mr. Goldberg said to me, as if only the two of us existed. Trying what? I asked in a voice more concerned than I'd wanted. He took off his glasses again, trying to be. While her father and Mr. Goldberg spoke inside the makeshift salon, whose book's Separated inside from outside, Anna and I went for a walk over the reeds that lay across the gray-green clay by which once was a stall for horses, and down to where you could see the edge of the water if you knew where and how to look. We got mud halfway up our socks and juice from the fallen fruit we kicked out of our way. From the top of the property we could see the busy train station. The commotion of the war grew nearer and nearer. Soldiers went east through our town and refugees went west or stayed there. Trains arrived and departed, hundreds of them, we ended where we began, outside the shed that was a salon. Let's sit down, she said. We lowered ourselves to the ground, our backs against the shelves. We could hear them talking inside. The smell of the pipe smoke seeped between the books. Anna started kissing me. But what if they come out? I whispered, and she touched my ears, which meant their voices would keep us safe. She put her hands all over me. I didn't know what she was doing. I touched every part of her. What was I doing? Did we understand something that we couldn't explain? Her father said, You can stay for as long as you need. You can stay forever. She pulled her shirt over her head. I held her breasts in my hands. It was awkward, and it was natural. She pulled my shirt over my head. In the moment I couldn't see, Mr. Goldberg laughed and said, Forever! I heard him pacing in the small room. I put my hand under her skirt between her legs. Everything felt on the verge of bursting into flames. Without any experience, I knew what to do. It was exactly as it had been in my dreams, as if all the information had been coiled within me like a spring. Everything that was happening had happened before and would happen again. I don't recognize the world anymore, Anna's father said. 
Anna rolled onto her back behind a wall of books through which voices and pipe smoke escaped. I want to make love, Anna whispered. I knew exactly what to do. Night was arriving, trains were departing. I lifted her skirt. Mr. Goldberg said, I've never recognized it more. And I could hear him breathing on the other side of the books. If he had taken one from the shelf, he would have seen everything. But the books protected us. I was in her for only a second before I burst into flames. She whimpered. Mr. Goldberg stomped his foot and I let out a cry like a wounded animal. I asked her if she was upset. She shook her head no. I fell onto her, resting my cheek against her chest, and I saw your mother's face in the second floor window. Then why are you crying? I asked, exhausted and experienced. War, Mr. Goldberg said, angry and defeated, his voice trembling. We go on killing each other, to no purpose. It is war waged by humanity, against humanity, and it'll only end when there's no one left to fight. She said, it hurt. Do you know what time it is? Every morning before breakfast and before I come here, your mother and I go to the guest room. The animals follow us. I thumb through the blank pages and gesture laughter and gesture tears. If she asks what I'm laughing or crying about, I tap my finger on the page. And if she asks, why? I press her hand against her heart and then against my heart. Or I touch her forefinger to the mirror. Or touch it, quickly, against the hot plate. Sometimes I wonder if she knows. I wonder in my nothingest moments, if she's testing me, if she types nonsense all day long, or types nothing at all, just to see what I'll do in response. She wants to know if I love her. That's all anyone wants from anyone else. Not love itself, but the knowledge that love is there. Like new batteries in the flashlight in the emergency kit, in the hall closet. Don't let anyone see it, I told her that morning she first showed it to me, and maybe I was trying to protect her. Maybe I was trying to protect myself. We'll have it be our secret until it's perfect. We'll work on it together. We'll make it the greatest book anyone's ever written. You think that's possible? She asked. Outside, leaves fell from the trees. Inside, we were letting go of our concern for that kind of truth. I do, I said by touching her arm. If we try hard enough. She reached her hands in front of her and found my face. She said, I'm going to write about this. Ever since that day, I've been encouraging her, begging her to write more, to shovel deeper, Describe his face, I tell her, running my hands over the empty page, and then the next morning, describe his eyes, and then holding the page to the window, letting it fill with light, describe his irises, and then his pupils. She never asks, whose? She never asks, why? Are they my own eyes on those page? I've seen the left stack double and quadruple. I've heard of asides that have become tangents, that have become passages, that have become chapters, and I know because she told me that what was once the second sentence is now the second to last. Just two days ago, she said that her life story was happening faster than her life. What do you mean? I asked with my hands. So little happens, she said, and I'm so good at remembering. You could write about the store. I've described every diamond in the case. You could write about other people. My life story is the story of everyone I've ever met. You could write about your feelings, she asked. Aren't my life and my feelings the same thing? Excuse me, where do you get tickets? I have so much to tell you. The problem isn't that I'm running out of time. I'm running out of room. This book is filling up. There couldn't be enough pages. I looked around the apartment this morning for one last time, and there was writing everywhere, filling the walls and mirrors. I'd rolled up the rugs so I could write on the floors. I'd written on the windows and around the bottles of wine that we were given, but never drank. I wear only short sleeves, even when it's cold, because my arms are books, too. But there's too much to express. I'm sorry. That's what I've been trying to say to you. I'm sorry for everything. For having said goodbye to Anna when maybe I could have saved her, and our idea, or at least died with them. I'm sorry for my inability to let the unimportant things go, for my inability to hold on to the important things. I'm sorry for what I'm about to do to your mother and to you. I'm sorry I'll never get to see your face and feed you and tell you bedtime stories. I've tried in my own way to explain myself, but when I think of your mother's life story, I know that I haven't explained a thing. She and I are no different. I've been writing nothing to the dedication she said to me this morning, just a few hours ago, when I went to the guest room for the last time, Read it. I touched my fingers to her eyelids and opened her eyes wide enough to convey every possible meaning. I was about to leave her behind without saying goodbye, to turn my back on a marriage of millimeters and rules. Do you think it's too much? She asked, bringing me back to her invisible dedication. 
I touched her with my right hand, not knowing to whom she had dedicated her life story. It's not silly, is it? I touched her with my right hand, and I was missing her already. I wasn't having second thoughts, but I was having thoughts. It's not vain. I touched her with my right hand, and for all I knew, she dedicated it to herself. Does it mean everything to you? She asked, this time putting her finger on what wasn't there. I touched her with my left hand, and for all I knew, she dedicated it to me. I told her that I had to get going. I asked her, with a long series of gestures that would have made no sense to anyone else, if she had wanted anything special. You always get it right, she said. Some nature magazines? I flapped her hands like wings. That'd be nice. Maybe something with art in it? I took her hand like a brush and painted an imaginary painting in front of us. Sure. She walked me to the door, as she always did. I might not be back before you fall asleep. I told her, putting my open hand on her shoulder and then easing her cheek into my palm. She said, But I can't fall asleep without you. I held her hand against my head and nodded that she could. We walked to the door, navigating a something path. And what if I can't fall asleep without you? I held her hands against my head and nodded. And what if? I nodded. Answer me that, she said. I shrugged my shoulders. Promise me you'll take care, she said, pulling the hood of my coat over my head. Before you cross the street, I want you to look both ways a second time, because I told you to. I nodded. She asked, are you wearing lotion? With my hands, I told her, it's cold out. You have a cold. She asked, but are you? I surprised myself by touching her with my right hand. I could live a lie, but not bring myself to tell that small one. She said, hold on, and ran inside the apartment and came back with a bottle of lotion. She squeezed some into her hand and rubbed her hands together and spread it on the back of my neck and the tops of my hands between my fingers and on my nose and forehead, my cheeks, my chin, everything that was exposed. In the end, I was the clay and she was the sculptor, I thought. It's a shame that we have to live, but it's a tragedy that we only get to live one life, because if I'd have two lives, I would have spent one of them with her. I would have stayed in the apartment with her, torn the blueprint from the door, held her on the bed and said, I want two rolls, saying, start spreading the news, laughed, cried, cried help. I would have spent that life among the living. We rode the elevator down together and walked to the threshold. She stopped and I kept going. I knew that I was about to destroy what she'd been able to rebuild, but I had only one life. I heard her behind me. Because of myself or despite myself, I turned back. Don't cry, I told her, by putting my fingers on my face and pushing imaginary tears up my cheek and back into my eyes. I know, she said as she wiped the real tears from her cheeks. I stomped my feet. This meant, I won't go to the airport. Go to the airport, she said. I touched her chest, then pointed her hand out towards the world, then pointed her hand at her chest. I know, she said. Of course I know that. I held her hands and pretended we were behind an invisible wall, or behind the imaginary painting, our palms exploring its surface. Then, at the risk of saying too much, I held one of her hands over my eyes and the other over her eyes. You are too good to me, she said. I put her hands on my head and nodded yes. She laughed. I love it when she laughs although the truth is that I am not in love with her. She said, I love you. I told her how I felt. This is how I told her. I held her hands out to her sides. I pointed her index fingers towards each other and slowly, very slowly, moved them in. The closer they got, the more slowly I moved them. And then, as they were about to touch, as they were only a dictionary page from touching, pressing on opposite sides of the word love, I stopped them. I stopped them and held them there. I don't know what she thought. I don't know what she understood or what she wouldn't allow herself to understand. I turned around and walked away from her. I didn't look back. I won't. I'm telling you all this because I'll never be your father, and you will always be my child. I want you to know at least that it's not out of selfishness that I am leaving. How can I explain that? I can't live. I've tried and I can't. If it sounds simple, it's simple like a mountain simple. Your mother suffered too. But she chose to live, and lived. Be her son. And her husband. I don't expect that you'll ever understand me, much less forgive me. You might not even read these words, if your mother gives them to you at all. It's time to go. I want you to be happy. I want that more than I want happiness for myself.
Does that sound simple? I'm leaving. I'll rip these pages from this book, take them to the mailbox before I get on the plane, address the envelope to my unborn child, and I'll never write another word again. I'm gone. I'm no longer here. With love, your father. I want to buy a ticket to Dresden. What are you doing here? You have to go home. You should be in bed. Let me take you home. You're being crazy. You're going to catch a cold. You're going to catch a colder.